Hi, everyone. This episode features MIT nuclear physicist Christina Migliori. It was recorded in early 2022 before the unfolding of world events in Russia and Ukraine. We mentioned that part of the world a few times in this episode, especially when we talk about the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I'm just here to let you know that we weren't ignoring the invasion or the attack on Chernobyl. It just hadn't happened yet when we were recording. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. Hello! Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here on the Lunarverse today. I am Dr. Charles Liu. Please call me Chuck. It would be a pleasure if you would do that. It is my pleasure to introduce Alan Liu, our co-host. Hello, Alan. Hello. Uh, anything exciting going on these days? I mean, the universe is really exciting. I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> you will, young Jedi. You will. And joining us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, near the MIT campus uh, where you're based, uh, something oh, like that. Enough. Yes, is Christina <laughs> Migliori. Hello, Christina. It's great to Hello. see you. Uh, as a nuclear physicist uh, and, and someone who can tell us about fusion and stuff, we cannot wait to have you tell us all kinds of great stuff and, and just have a fun conversation. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> I am too, uh, because you know what? Nuclear fusion... You get a lot of it in everything, science fiction, blah, 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 future visions of everything. But you know what? What is the actual ground truth? Hmm? Beyond the <laughs> hype, what is the reality? You are our touchstone for nuclear fusion. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, okay. So we start as usual with today's joyfully cool cosmic thing and this comes to us from the United Kingdom. Not that long ago, there is this thing over there called Jet in this town near Oxford, somewhere in England. And they did something very cool. I mean, cosmically amazing, because we always think, oh, nuclear fusion's off in the future. It'll never you know, actually do something. But the Jet folks were able to produce 59 megajoules of nuclear fusion energy in five seconds. Yeah, pretty awesome. And then their magnets like overheated. So um, <laughs> please, Christina, I know it's, this is super cool, but give us some context. What is so cool about JET? I mean, first of all, what does JET even stand for? And then after that, why is this experiment so awesome? All right, so JET is the Joint European Taurus. As you mentioned, it's pretty much this metal donut um, that's located <laughs> in the UK uh, oh. that does plasma physics and nuclear fusion, like you mentioned. Wow, and like donut like this big, like like the kind that I would get from Tim Hortons or Duncan or something oh, like that? No, <laughs> no, it is, it's uh, significant. I want to say it's like a few meters across. Okay. So you can actually okay. have people walk through like inside the machine. So oh, oh, oh. It's relatively big, but okay. uh, for Tokamaks, it's actually about average size. Oh, so, okay. so tell us, okay, this word Tokamak, which you just used, what what does that yes. mean? Uh, so it's, uh, that actually is a Russian acronym, hey. it's like a magnetic confinement device, which is okay. exactly what that is. Um, Yes, uh, the, the most common form of uh, experimental devices to create nuclear fusion on Earth. Oh. So you hear that term thrown around a lot. Okay. Um, so how do you make a donut fuse? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, so you, like I mentioned, you have this metal donut mach machine, um, and then you pump in neutral gas. You run a current through it along the donut. Um, and then you get the particles hot enough to ionize and create something that's known as plasma, which is the fourth state of matter. Mm -hmm. um, from there, in order to, you want to keep your plasma within this device. Um, so you actually have all these magnetic fields that confine it to that uh, kind of the interior of the donut itself. So uh, these particles follow the field lines. And then from there, you heat it up and then the particles can actually fuse together and create energy. Oh, wow. Okay. I think I followed that, but we're going to get into more detail in a little bit. <laughs> First, Alan, can you give us a question from a student? Sure. So our first student question um, is from Caroline from the Pingry School. And Caroline is asking, what is fusion and why does it occur in stars? Oh, let's just start at the very <laughs> beginning. 
Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So fusion is one of the processes where two particles collide and the energy is more favorable for it to be stay, to stick together rather than get bounced back out. out. So uh, you actually release energy when these two particles fuse together into a heavier element. Um, so you actually get energy out, but you, get, you create one object. So uh, with stars, from what I understand, <laughs> I do more st stuff on the, um, the Earth. Yeah. Like experimental things. Yeah, right. They um, are different, yeah. actually. They're, they're two different yes. kinds of fusion, right? There's like a lot of different kinds of fusion, not just like one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there is. Uh, a lot of it is more lighter uh, elements like hydrogen fusing together. For mm -hmm. us, we care about two isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium, which is favorable for energy purposes on Earth. But I know the sun does two, I think it's hydrogens, like the proton-proton reaction. And then mm. it kind of builds its way up to uh, uh, helium, uh, I think, atom, and then releases energy. I think the sun actually ends up going through stages of creating heavier and heavier um, elements until I think iron, I want to say. But that's yeah. a way further into its uh, lifespan. But right. uh, stars, that's how they actually are able to sustain, I guess, the energy kind of like um, the sun does. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty much a hot ball of plasma. So that's how yeah. it's its energy. <laughs> so this is the plasma that you were talking about in the donut, right? I mean, yes. it, it's, it's inside the interior of the donut. It's not in the donut hole itself. Like the Correct. donut hole is yes. just air, right? So it's just like yes. contact with regular stuff. So, you know, normally you think of like fusion being at the center of something, but this is actually around the outside of the stuff. Oh, yeah. So, so you're, are you shooting like deuterium this way and tritium the other way, and then they smack into each other and then they turn into something, or is it a different mechanism? I just think of collisions, but I, I, that might not be the right mental model. That's a, that's an interesting way to think about it. Most, it is two, uh, I guess, ionized particles hitting each other and fusing. Uh, but the way it works is, uh, that maybe you're thinking more of kind of the inertial confinement, which is where you have this like tiny little metal pellet and you shoot a giant laser into it and it oh. causes a creation of plasma, which is another way to do fusion. And actually they, some Lawrence Livermore has the highest, um, I think it's the strongest laser in the world wow. um, called NIF national ignition facility. And they actually ah. just reached, uh, I think a pretty incredible milestone, um, in the net energy they got out in that system. Wow. So it's kind of competing with tokamaks with energy oh. as well. National so. Ignition Facility. That is yeah. a cool, that I, I appreciate that name. What name is cooler? Uh -huh. Ignition <laughs> Facilities or tokamaks? Yeah, they both sound pretty good to me. Uh, yeah. But you work it's on- It's a very cool device. Oh yeah? yeah. You've seen it before. You, you've seen- uh, I've been in the building next to it. But, um, they actually filmed, I think, a few Star Trek movies on the on the actual outside of the device. Oh, yeah, oh, it's very it's high tech. The warp core, right? Really? I think so. Yeah, yeah. You can see pictures of it. They do filming there all the time. Wow, it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it it just it just makes me wonder what you are doing scientifically. <laughs> in the tokamak stuff. How are you and your research directly affecting all these thoughts that we're doing? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Uh, so kind of there's two uh, hot topics, ironically, um, in, the fusion, <laughs> <laughs> in the fusion research uh, realm right now. One is the engineering aspect of building these devices. Specifically right now, it's building high magnetic fields. Um, That's a very exciting area of research right now because uh, you know, with technology, we've been actually kind of constrained with um, how high the magnetic field can be for these mm -hmm. kind of devices because of copper magnets. You know, they're very complicated, but, you know, you they have to be run at like four Kelvin, very cold, um, only reach a certain amount. Yeah. And it's, it's very expensive to keep magnets cold. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you're kind of talking about how much power you can get out, but you have to put in like significant amount of power. Right. Because because so. cause four Kelvin is like 455 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Right. Yeah. It's so, very so cold. You, so it's, you can't just like put it in your freezer. It's like liquid yeah. helium and, and that all ble yes. bleeds away and stuff like that. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, okay. So, so that's the old technology. Cool. 
Um, mm -hmm. Now uh, there's actually this new material that's called um, a high a high temperature superconductor that you're able to build magnets, um, uh, and I think they're run. Don't quote me on this. I think it's 40 Kelvin. It's something significantly larger. Oh. Yeah, it's way less. Uh, taxing uh, or maintenance wise with, with co the costs. And you can also build way larger magnetic fields with it. Wow. Um, so very exciting because with um, Tokamax, the uh, power that you get out actually scales with the magnetic field to the fourth power. So you can even oh, nice. double it. That's two to the four. Uh, so you get a significant, time. yeah, you get a significant output. Uh, so I think that's kind of where the future is going right now with Tokamax. So, um, so that's, yeah. So building those, uh, magnets is very, um, kind of popular right now. Okay. And the other part, which is kind of the field I'm in is the, um, the wall interactions with the plasma. Oh. So, you know, if, yeah, if you have your plasma with inside the donut, um, yeah. technically the plasma has to touch the wall at certain points or sorry, all, everywhere pretty much. Um, and plasma is very, very, very hot. Uh, <laughs> the center of that kind of, you t if you slice into a donut, kind of like right through, not like a bagel, the other way, um, if yeah, that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Um, oh. And then you look inside either end of it. Um, you have the core, and I think it's 15 times hotter than the center of the sun. Ah! So it's very hot. <laughs> it's like 300, 300 million degrees. Wow. Yeah, and that's the temperature you need to fuse. Uh, so, so, so the sun can get away with a, a lower temperature, but we have to do the higher ones. Yeah, for DT, there's a specific peak in um, the reaction rate, and that's kind of what we try okay. to go for. So it's just to make um, the best efficiency thing. Yeah. In order to get the plasma at that temperature, we have ways of heating the plasma, uh, which is where my project comes in, where we use waves pretty much to microwave, you know, you give a mi microwave, you send in some <laughs> radiation, heats things up. So exactly the same thing, but we huh. use a specific frequency that helps um, send energy from the wave to the particles, gets it nice and hot. Mm. Uh, is that a secret a frequency or, or is did, no, are you allowed to tell common. us what it is? Oh, okay. <laughs> the one I've been working with is 80 megahertz, which happens to correspond to a harmonic of the ion gyrating around a magnetic field. Okay. Okay. So, so, so how long yeah. is that wavelength then at 80 megahertz? I should be able to do this in my head, but obviously I cannot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so in vacuum, it's three meters, but oh, with plasmas, okay. you have a dielectric that's very complicated, but it's very localized, especially in the center where there's all this temperature effects. So actually oh. your wavelength changes as the wave <laughs> goes along into the, into the device to get absorbed. Wow. But I think I work with, I want to say, I'm gonna say like seven centimeters. It's oh. it's smaller. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because yeah. yeah, you know, as astronomers, we just uh, we we <laughs> we astronomers think of everything in vacuum, right? Uh, unless we're actually looking, for example, in the regions in a star or around mm -hmm. a planet or something like that. Uh, we're just thinking, oh, it's always in vacuums. Like, oh, it's in vacuum. So it'd be like ten feet long in vacuum, but now you're just talking about a few inches as a result of the structure that's involved there. Wow. Yeah. But, that's an extreme environment to be sure. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. Um, so when you send in these waves, uh, there's this negative effect that happens where when whenever inevitably the wave hits the wall after not being fully absorbed into the plasma, it causes something that's called rectification, which basically it's a fancy word, but there's, there's more potential on your wall. Uh, again, I don't need to go into the specifics, but <laughs> Sure, All you need to know is that there's these kind of hot spots in the area, especially on the antenna, mm, uh, okay. where, you know, ions uh, get accelerated into the wall and hit it very energetically and cause oh. impurity generation, which is really right. bad for your plasma. You have to make sure that, that that's what the magnetic bottle thing is all about, right? You don't want any of those particles inside to actually touch anything. You got to suspend Yeah. Them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... Yeah, my research has to do with uh, in trying to investigate the behavior of that rectification. Oh, because um, ICRF, which is what I, it was what it's called, ion cyclotron radio frequency, uh -huh. uh, it's just like the frequency yeah. range of these ions, um, is very commonly used right now, and it's going to be used in the future because it's very reliable. So it's kind of important to understand these two effects, especially yeah. for fusion devices. Oh, I see. So your goal is to figure out how that's all going to work when we're actually all <laughs> depending on nuclear fusion. 
right? Yeah, we want to model it and know exactly where oh, things are going to go wrong with the materials. So sounds like some heavy, yeah, sounds like some heavy computational stuff you're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's all computational for me. I mean, this is not oh, stuff yeah. that I can just do like on my laptop or something, right? This is some serious heavy things. Yeah, I use uh, <laughs> something called the finite element method, which solves equations oh. on these little grids and then kind of connects it all together. Oh. Uh, but, you know, it's funny. It only, the only complication, uh, sorry, it's not even that complicated in the sense that it's only solving Maxwell's equations. You know, you have your wave and you have a dielectric. So you can tell where the wave's going to go if you have a dial if you know the dielectric. So that part's not too bad. But um, the complication <laughs> with my project is the boundary condition that is used to model the this um, region like next to the wall. Oh. It's a complicated nonlinear function. So I see um, those are bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, Alan, you know, as a mathematician, also understands how these equations blow up near the surfaces. I mean, but you know, I being an observer, I've always just you know, given up. When I compute <laughs> things like, you know, Maxwell's equations, which uh, for those of you in the audience who haven't taken electromagnetism yet, is basically a set of equations that governs how electromagnetic waves travel through space or through materials, basically. Um, I always learned how to do it, you know, assuming that you're far away from any surface, far away <laughs> from, from literally anything, right, out in space. Yeah. <laughs> These things are going and going. I, I don't calculate that stuff. I mean, how do you even deal with that? Like on an intellectual basis, I don't even know. Uh, it's so complicated sometimes, especially when you're, like I said, your dielectric is, has kinetic effects in it. Uh, it has all, it's all very tied together. Um, and we have these very complicated codes, at least. So I use, I, I work in the cold plasma regime where you can just assume there's no temperature, Ooh. which is kind of a cheat, but like I mentioned, it's a lot colder there compared to the center. Uh, so I use a very different dielectric than my office mate who does a lot of hot plasma stuff where he has to calculate all these things mm. and take them into account. When, <laughs> when you said cold plasma, I immediately thought of cold fusion. And oh. and the, the I, I kind of want to say pseudoscientific aspect of, of cold fusion. And of course, you know, those of us who like comic books and so forth, or, or at least the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we have been sold this bill of pseudoscientific goods where Iron Man's like arc reactor, the thing that like comes out of his chest and glows blue is actually cold fusion, you know, and, uh, and you know, you have to set us straight. Please tell us what actually cold fusion is, you know, as opposed to like cold plasma, which is something you're actually doing and, and is actually scientific. Give us the, like, why should we not go out and buy all the palladium in the world so that we can, <laughs> you know, power our Iron Man suits? Right. So I'm actually not very familiar with the, the Marvel Universe, but <laughs> okay. um, so I don't really know how Iron Man's um, suit is designed. But, Guess what? No uh, one else does either. <laughs> Nobody. Zip, zero, nada. Because <laughs> if we were, everybody would be Iron Man, right? We are Iron Man. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> So from what I understand, I don't think cold fusion is a real thing since uh, we have these well-known uh, reaction rates for, you know, specific ionized um, particles uh, hitting each other. So we know there's a specific temperature range where this fusion actually occurs and all of the reaction rate plots we see. Uh, the temperature is very hot. I think it's on the order of one keV, which um is definitely not cold i don't i i can't tell you exactly what that is in degrees i just know it in electron volts but uh okay. the region i work in is 10 ev so it's way smaller um but there's no fusion going on in in that area because okay. i i it's not in the core i'm I'm in the edge there kind of working so, with so this is just the stuff supporting the center plasma doing its own fusion yeah it's kind of like the particles that kind of escape the you know the confinement uh because it's not perfect you know there's some diffusion across field lines so that the dude's uh, like hanging out on the walls when, while everyone else is partying in the center <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been in some of those situations before <laughs> actually alan can you look up real quick like 10 electron volt photons actually represent what temperature is is that something that can easily found because uh, i would like to know cool so it turns out the conversion factor between electron volts and kelvin 
the temperature scale is actually Boltzmann's constant. Oh, um, yeah. so that's a uh, so using that according to um, our our favorite internet computational knowledge engine. <laughs> um, it says ten, ten electron volts is around a hundred thousand Kelvin. Does that does that sound right? That sounds about right. Two hundred thousand yeah. degrees Fahrenheit, roughly one hundred eighty thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, very cold. And that's cold. <laughs> That's cold. <laughs> yeah, in, in the center, it's like a thousand times more. Yeah, yes. that's crazy. Okay, all right. So, so this whole cold fusion arc thing, wearing on his chest at one hundred and eighty thousand degrees, would basically burn a hole in Tony Stark's chest, as opposed to actually powering, you know, these repulsors and stuff. All right, good. Thank you, Alan. That that clarifies a lot about the additional pseudo scientific entertainment of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or really any other comic universe. Now, you all know that I love comic books and I love that stuff for fun, but it's always fun to sort of see just how real or unreal these things are. So, I, I thank That's you fair. for for giving that. Okay, so uh, talk about nuclear fission for a second, Christina. You must also now be an expert in that. And of course, you know, we, we in our society now are wrestling with this concept of nuclear fission, right? Uh, not that far away from our house is a nuclear power plant, which actually two of them, one to the north and one to the south. And if either one of them were to go, you know, Fukushima or Chernobyl or something like that, we'd have to evacuate our homes. Um, but you know, is that actually realistic? We've seen it happen in history, but how how worried should we be about nuclear fission, like the current nuclear reactors and so forth? Good question. So yeah, I feel like nuclear fission um, has a bad rap in history and in current kind of opinions. Um, I personally think it's a it's a positive thing. I think it's necessary if we want to go to a carbon neutral. Um, kind of energy, um, which is obviously the way I think we should go. Uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, fission devices around, or plants, I should say, because they're putting energy to the grid um, around us. Unfortunately, a lot of them are actually closing. Like I know Indian Point right above New York City, which provides about, I think, 11% of its energy to New York City, uh, just, I believe, closed its doors which is kind of sad, but Whoa. at the same time, we have to uh, remember that these plants were built for a 40 year lifetime. And I think Indian Port's about maybe 60 years old. So it's oh. way past the you know, timeline that the materials can withstand that kind of radiation. So oh, okay. it, it's time for it to be probably retired. Um, but I, I think fission is very important. I, it's, I, it's very safe. Uh, there's actually so a <laughs> it is if it's done correctly. Okay. Um, and actually, MIT has a reactor on campus. I sit oh. maybe a, a few, like a block away from it. Oh my um, gosh! <laughs> yeah, right in the middle of Cambridge. Uh, are you? It's are very you? Safe. Are you growing a second head? I mean, is there <laughs> <laughs> nuclear, you know, coming out right now? No, you you feel comfortable There's, with this? Holy yeah, moly! Yeah. So if you ever go to visit it, you actually get a Geiger counter, which counts the amount of radiation you get exposed to while you're in the reactor. Um, and it's such a negligible amount. I'm not like touching any of the uranium. It's all very under control there. Um, if you're out on the street, you know, you, you're, you're perfectly safe. Um, so yeah, uh, radiation in the sense of being outside a nuclear reactor is, isn't an issue. Okay. Yeah, like you mentioned with history, unfortunately, there have been un kind of mistakes done. And I think one of the most memorable, obviously, is Chernobyl. And I think HBO did a very interesting piece on it <laughs> called Chernobyl, <laughs> uh, which I watched. And I'll be honest, as a Russian, <laughs> um, I think it did a great job in portraying that it wasn't exactly the... It, there was a design flaw in the actual device, uh, which had to do with the control rods, but it really had to do with bureaucracy. And that's, oh. uh, uh, yeah, it's because, uh, you know, they were running this test where they put the machine to the limits of its operation um, and were taking it very, very low power. They're you know, they're doing this, this test with, I think, shutting down the water pumps. I can't remember exactly what happened, but... Uh, it was it was a test that went wrong, and the the person behind the controls, you know, hit the um, you know panic button. I guess you could call it, where you put all of the control rods into the rods of the 
you know, where the uranium is to stop all reactions, just to just turn everything off. And unfortunately, the way that rod was designed was there was this little um, material at the top, like right at the beginning of it that actually accelerates um, oh, no. uh, nuclear fission. Oh, yeah. No. So what happened was they hit the the uranium and just pff, exploded. So, so in, um, the, in the attempt to shut it off, they actually sent it into hyper mode for a brief yes, exactly. moment. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, the, the saddest part is that um, this the design of this control rod was kept secret. So people didn't oh, know no. about it. So you think oh, as a, a reactor and en engineer, you're like, I just need to shut this down, stop whatever's happening right now. Cause the test was going wrong, I think. Um, yeah. And they didn't know. Uh, and this was also a B team. It wasn't the original operating team that was supposed to run this device. Cause they pushed it, they delayed it cause they needed power to, I think um, the grid at that time. Yeah, they so. needed to, to meet their their monthly production goals in, in exactly. the local area. Wow. So now things have changed a lot since then. Also, you have to remember, um, Chernobyl did not have one of those domes over their uh, plant. So all of it just went into the air, all that radiation. Oh, now, geez. as you see, all the fission reactors here have all those domes, which mm. actually helps a lot to contain the damage. So it's very important uh, to design right now. But, okay. Yeah, it's very it's very safe now. We have a nuclear regulatory committee that constantly does checks on all of the um, fission plants, has very strict protocol. So everything is checked, made sure, and all the operators are trained at very, very intense coursing with it. Okay. So that's about that. yeah. right. reassuring. Yeah, <laughs> that's just exactly uh, Alan's sentiment. It's reassuring that that's true. I guess the thing that still worries me is that they've extended past beyond their warranty. If, if a 60 year old thing is only supposed to last for 40 years, then no amount of you know, protection can really eventually keep it from, from getting into trouble. Right. Yeah. And then there's and always, yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Alan, can you feed yeah. us another question or other cool news or information? Okay. So the second question um, is by Josh, also from Pingree School. And Josh is asking, how would nuclear fusion be affected by strong gravitational forces? This is a fun question because as someone who works on tokamaks, not a thing. We <laughs> neglect gravitational force. It's gone. <laughs> um, so uh, that's more of, I think, an astrophysicist would know a better question to that since there's so many extreme cases of gravity, especially in stars where fusion happens. Um, and I think mm -hmm. the way that I could best answer that question is, Gravity acts as kind of a like a bear like a pressure to keep the plasma all in like a center of a ball. Um, mm. So that's kind of one of the reasons why we get asked like, how can you put a star onto the Earth? Um, how is the star able to sustain fusion, but we're not on Earth? Mm. Uh, well, the star has gravity keeping it together, and it's mm. a pressure. Um, you know, it's a force keeping the plasma there, heating it up and causing it to fuse. So strong gravity helps to promote uh, fusion in stars, uh, which we don't have that luxury here. Oh, <laughs> That's fair. We do have it. We're just not where we want to be. OK. Yeah. So, so when are we going to be where we want to be, Christina? It, Great it, question as well. Yeah. Is it is it um, 40 years from now? Is it 400 years from now? Is it four years from now? It's so funny. There's actually this joke in the community that fusion's always 30 years away, which is kind of <laughs> been true for a long time but since i mentioned um, there's this new material where we're able to build stronger and high, um, and higher magnetic field magnets um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a, uh, a device being built um, mit and this private company called cfs common commonwealth fusion systems uh, mm -hmm. is building this device um, that will have a very strong magnetic field mm -hmm. and uh, I believe they started already building it. So I oh, think wow. it will be online in 2025. So this is still a science experiment, oh, but it's okay. going to um, create. So there's this Q value, which basically signifies um, the ratio of the energy you put in versus the energy you get out through fusion. Um, and kind of the break even is one, right? That you get the same amount of energy out as you put in. And that's mm -hmm. kind of been always a big goal in fusion. Um, and unfortunately, Makes we haven't sense. reached that right now. Mm -hmm. But with Spark and actually another device called Eater, uh, they're projecting cues of 10, um, if not oh. more. So 
yeah so um, you get so out 10 times more energy than you more put more than in. you put in yeah very That's exciting amazing. fusion is looking really good right now this is a very exciting time this is the first time you know there's a lot of uh agreement in the community that this is going to create kind of in our lifetime actual fusion reactors on the grid which wow. would be very exciting whoa yeah christina miliari thank you so much for joining us it has been such a pleasure is there any way we can keep track of what you're doing? Do you have uh, somewhere where we can share or find out about what you're doing as we move forward? Uh, that's a good question. I'm kind of off the grid, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> like the Hopefully you'll be able to see my name when I finish my thesis. There you go. That will be a great accomplishment. <laughs> yes, it will. Alan, thank you so much for all that you're doing. I really appreciate it, as always. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Christina, for being with us today. It was such a pleasure chatting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And for all of you out there, if you want to support this program, please find us on Patreon. And as always, thank you for being a part of the Lunarverse. <laughs>